Washington University. And we have Lior Handelman, who's a research fellow at the Center for Iranian Studies. Um, we have four, I think, very important uh, talks, so we're going to get to it quickly. Um, so, Dr. Ross. Very good. Well, I thought that I would start with the good news and then end with the bad news. But I should tell you from the beginning, the good news is not very good, and the bad news is very bad. <laughs> so why does Iran want to have the capability to build nuclear weapons? The good news is that as of yet, there is, really is no major actor on the Iranian political scene who thinks that I Iran should provoke an apocalypse in order to bring the return of uh, the hidden Imam. That it, the general perception uh, is that, uh, uh, more radical people, is that the return of the hidden Imam is something to be expected and not just fervently hoped for, but to be expected. And that when the hidden Imam comes, there will indeed be a bloody apocalyptic battle in which most non-believers will die. But, at least so far, uh, their conception is that we should prepare for this day, which will come soon, not that there are things that we can do to hasten. And certainly not that we need to provoke a great battle in order to see. However, I worry. Uh, by the way, if you're interested in knowing more about this subject, we published in the Washington Institute a very detailed study about apocalyptic politics um, by Nehti Khalaji, who spent 14 years studying the problem. And what I worry about is that uh, the crowd that now has power <coughs> in Iran is largely uh, people who were um, uh, more influenced by folk religion than they are by the great philosophical traditions. Khomeini was very much the product of Ohm's seminaries, which emphasized this great philosophical tradition. Khomeini is very much the product of Mashad, which where the seminaries have as a principle that uh, reason is inappropriate in matters of religion. And furthermore, Khomeini is an individual, and certainly Ahmadinejad is an individual, a profoundly superstitious people who believe all sorts of things that are contrary to reason. Khomeini is personally convinced that with sufficient faith, one can teleport oneself around the world. That's Khomeini, not Ahmadinejad. And more than that, if we get to the level of Ahmadinejad, he is someone who has spent most of his life thinking that his revolutionary Islam is more real than the American Islam of the Ayatollahs, some of whom he's been arresting. And therefore, <coughs> that he knows better than they do. And that the folk religion, which he likes, um, doesn't have any great texts. It's not quite the case that he makes it all up. But it's certainly not emerging out of a centuries-old tradition. He could therefore change his mind about the question of the For one thing, uh, Ahmadinejad is firmly convinced, as are most of the people around him, and are many of the people of that generation from which he emerges, namely the generation of people who were involved in the war against Iraq, and that is the generation which is really taking over in Iran from the revolutionary generation, that <clears throat> with sufficient elan, as the French would say, that one can find. And this generation is profoundly ignorant to the outside world. And that is why we get kind of comments from Ahmadinejad in the last month he's been going around explaining repeatedly that Iran is the world's greatest power, that the countdown to the disintegration of the corrupt West has already been done. And he really means this. When uh, Kofi Annan went on his goodbye tour, a farewell tour of, um, before he left office as Secretary General, and he stopped in Tehran, the New York Times account uh, was described how in 
Abu Najad, meeting with Anand, complained that the structures of the United Nations were too much based on the world of 1945 and not contemporary realities. Abu Najad went on to add, Britain and America may have won the last world war, but we intend to win the next one. Okay, not, had not even known there was going to be a next world war. Uh, but Abu Najad really does think that uh, Iran's revolution leads the world's one point some billion Muslims, and that they can be triumphant in the world war. And furthermore, he taps into a revolutionary strand in this Islamic revolution, which sees a common cause of people like Chavez, who's been to Tehran six times, Abu Najad talks twice. Um, now, this vision of Iran as a great power is something that the Islamic Republic has used effectively as a way to tap in to the great nationalist pride that many Iranians have, which is quite unconnected to Islam. Uh, we tend to think of Iran as a mid-sized power that excels at causing trouble. Iranians tend to think of themselves as a great civilization whose natural boundaries extend much faster than the current state of Iran. And, and Iranians tend to be quite well, uh, have this conception of this great power of Iran. Uh, Mike Huber and I wrote a book about the history of Iran where he made this sense of nationalism as a major theme. And I think that that was a very accurate call and that this current crowd very much reflects that. Um, uh, and that is simply unacceptable to Iran's neighbors. <coughs> and Iran has been unsuccessful at gaining the kind of influence that it thinks it naturally deserves. And this drive for nuclear capabilities is largely rooted in its desire to have the kind of influence which Iran thinks is its natural due. <clears throat> now, that's not because Iran intends to drop nuclear weapons on all its neighbors. It's because, in fact, the possession of nuclear weapons, or even just the possession of nuclear capabilities, creates ambiguity about whether or not one is or is not a nuclear state. Something that the author of mine and I call the nuclear ray. Um, that, that can provide an umbrella for a whole variety of these activities. Let me just give one simple example. If it were widely felt that Iran might have its covert nuclear weapon, then the discussion that would take place in the Israeli Defense Force about whether or not to intervene in Gaza could be an entirely different discussion if Iran said that such intervention would be contrary to Iran's supreme national security. The way in which the IDF would approach that question would be very different. And if the Iranians would openly and blatantly provide Hamas with longer range missiles, not just short rockets, but longer range missiles that could be developed. Again, the discussion of the IDF about what to do about this situation would be entirely different. Entirely different if uh, Iran were thought to be nuclear capable. And that is a way in which these nuclear weapons have historically been used. <coughs> Frankly, most of the countries which acquired nuclear weapons engaged in foreign policy adventurism after they got them. We now know in great detail Stalin's encouragement of the, of the North Korean invasion of South Korea. We saw not long after the Chinese got nuclear weapons and their provoking of incidents on the border with, uh, with the Soviet Union attempting to acquire territory back. As we see with the Pakistanis and uh, there the episodes with the Chinese, both the Kargil Glacier, which came close to becoming a full-scale war, and also the attack in the Indian Parliament. So there is a long history of foreign policy adventurism after acquiring nuclear weapons. And I would argue that this, rather than defensive motivations, is at the core of what Iran is interested in with the nuclear capabilities. 
Because if we look at Iran's situation, there is no real need for Iran to have nuclear weapons. And more importantly, if we look at the security debates inside Iran, those who are the most important decision makers are not concerned about any putative threat to invade the country. Now, if we just start with the first, which is what is the reality, uh, I would just like to remind people the reason that countries have signed the non-proliferation treaty, well, no, let me just start with the common ease concession. That's more important. It's more important to start with how the leaders themselves view things and what they see as their problems. Now, Khamenei is very clear about this. What he worries about is cultural invasion, not military invasion. He thinks the way in which that his regime is vulnerable and fragile is to a velvet revolution like that which overthrew the Czechoslovak government because he thinks that the West is very effective with, at, at uh, its propaganda and sponsorship of civil society organizations and that what happened in Eastern Europe could certainly happen in Iran. That's his reading of the events of 1997 to 1999, flirtation with reform, is that the youth, women, and intellectuals would love to abandon the Islamic Republic. And that is what he fears could lead to the overthrow of his regime. I mean, that's why he throws a 67-year-old grandmother in jail for months, uh, because he really does believe that can break out regime. And puts on television, a show explaining this, which goes into detail about the close collaboration between George Soros and George Bush and their common effort to bring down the Iranian government. Now, somebody coming from Washington, the idea that Mr. Soros and Mr. Bush work together <laughs> is intriguing. <laughs> a, a recent television show, by the way, on uh, Iran, uh, showed uh, George Soros and John McCain in their weekly meeting of deciding on what it is that the chance should be the demonstrators in Tehran. <coughs> Fictional. Um, so that's Khamenei's conception of the threat to his regime is not military invasion. If you're faced with cultural invasion, nuclear weapons are not particularly useful for that. But there are realities in Iran's situation are also that nuclear weapons would be unhelpful. Uh, because the reason that most countries do not want nuclear weapons is because while they might think that weapons would be pretty good to have, defense purposes, they realized that if they got weapons, so would their neighbors. They would start an arms race. And indeed, since Iran's nuclear program has accelerated, there have been more than $60 billion in arms orders placed by countries in the, in the region. Arms primarily aimed at Iran. Iran's neighbors are richer and better placed than Iran, and they will win an arms race. And the great fear of major powers is that, in fact, that this race will turn nuclear. To be blunt about it, the reason that the French really care about Iran's nuclear program is not because of Iran's threats to Israel. It's because of the threat of the world going nuclear and the threat of the global non-proliferation system. And there is a reason why each of the major powers in approaching the Iran nuclear program approach it as a non-proliferation issue. To be quite blunt, their main concern is not the revolutionary character of the Iranian regime. Their concern is that many other states will imitate Iran if Iran is successfully able to develop nuclear weapons within the framework of the NPT without paying a price. And that's why this is seen as a global security issue of great concern, and not because of the threat that this represents uh, to Israel or the threats it represents to peace in the Middle East. Thank you very much. Um, what I want to do is look at two major themes because in 10 minutes there's obviously not enough to counter everything or discuss everything. One would be the nuclear program and the second would be the challenge posed by um, successful application of Iranian soft power. First of all, one of the basic problems which we so often skirt around is does Iran need nuclear energy to fulfill its needs? Iran's electricity consumption is growing at around 8% per year. By 2012, annual consumption could be between 202 and 289 billion kilowatt hours. By 2015, Ministry of Energy estimates uh, is that it will, Iran will have to increase its capacity by about one-third to 60 gigawatts. But Iran already relies on natural gas-fired plants to 
produce about 75% of its electricity. At the same time, uranium resources are between 15,000 and 30,000 tons, and if Iran operates all of its planned reactors, not just the Bushehr plant, but the other seven or eight which they're discussing, uh, this would mean that Iran would deplete its uranium resources by around 2023. In addition, there's other issues which are well worn in, in the media and in IAEA inspection reports um, containing inconsistencies in the past with regard to Iran's explanations. Whatever one thinks of the 2000, um, of the most recent NIE, National Intelligence Estimate, it does have that tricky issue um, of Iran allegedly working on nuclear warhead design. And likewise, the very fact that the Natanz plant was covert for so long raises questions. And more recently, there's a lot of questions raised by the, um, the televised tour of the Bushir, um, of, of the nuclear facilities in which the Ministry of Defense took part. Because if it's purely a civilian reactor, why would, frankly, the Ministry of Defense appear to be leading the delegation there? The big problem for the US, and I agree with Patrick, I'm, I'm less worried about the millennialism, and I'm less worried about Iran simply dropping um, a nuclear bomb on any state, although I don't want to be so arrogant as to gamble with the lives of anyone in the region or elsewhere. But um, it's the issue of Iranian overconfidence should it feel it has a deterrent. And also, the biggest problem for diplomacy, which we're not really talking about, is what if Iran doesn't produce a nuclear weapon, but it achieves a similar breakout capacity, similar to what Japan has, in that if Japan chose it could withdraw from the NPT and assemble a nuclear weapon within about a week. And how do we deal with such a possibility with regard to Iran? I don't want to engage, I don't want to engage, I mean, international relations isn't just about consistency. And it's not just about moral equivalency. And I would assert quite firmly that there's a major difference between a Japanese government with a nuclear breakout capability and the Islamic Republic of Iran with a similar breakout. I'm going to come back to the nuclear issue in a second, but I also want to talk about some aspects of Iranian soft power, since this is uh, an abbreviated talk. And very much in the news has been Iranian outreach to Latin America, to which I'm going to also add um, what's been less in the news, which is Iranian outreach in Africa. The point of this will be showing that Iran, perhaps while Iranian nationalism, while the shrinking of Iran's borders from the Safavid era through um, the early Qajar period to the present, has led the Iranians perhaps to have a sense of a near abroad, not a desire to reconquer territory, but a desire to have a paramount influence in the region, whether that's Iraq, whether that's Western Afghanistan, and so forth, that it seems now that Iranian strategy is um, utilizing soft power to create a global interest, if you will, which I'm not sure that the US and other Western powers um, have started yet to counter if we deem it to be in our interest. In Venezuela, Ahmadinejad, for example, said, together we are growing stronger, and in truth, no one can defeat us. Um, Motaki, Foreign Minister Motaki, bragged recently that there would soon be $18 billion in Iran-Venezuela trade. Iran's embassy in Managua is the largest embassy of any country in Latin America. Um, if one looks at the numbers of trips taken by statesmen, and this is one of the major facets of, of soft power, for every trip Ahmadinejad takes to Africa or Latin America, and for every four trips he takes, George Bush takes one. And that doesn't include the frequent shuttle diplomacy conducted by people like Ayatollah Shafirudi who has been to Senegal, for example, many, many times. It does seem, when one looks at Iran's pattern of, if you will, picking up pivotal states, Venezuela, Nicaragua, um, Bolivia, Senegal, Zimbabwe, South Africa, um, that there is a pattern in which Iran isn't just exerting soft power without strings attached. There very much are strings attached, um, especially, for example, with South Africa in regard to support of Iran's positions in international organizations and so forth. In Sudan, um, Ahmadinejad defined the Iranian visits there with Omar al-Bashir as it being necessary to establish a common defense 
against international criticism. You support us in the nuclear issue, we support you in Darfur, and so forth. And so we, we have this aspect going out, and one can rightfully argue it's in any country's interest, pragmatically, to maximize its influence anywhere in the world. Um, true. But I would argue that it's also in U.S. interest to try to counter some of that, and not just to see the playing field in this regard, especially when it comes to um, some issues on the nuclear issue. Now, what does this lead us to in return to U.S. strategy? I do think Iran is filling a vacuum partly because, and it seems weird to get into the technocratic aspects of how bureaucracies are arranged, but of the over-compartmentalization of U.S. policy-making circles. The U.S. government, of course, has attention deficit disorder. That's been no secret, nor is it a partisan issue. Um, the U.S. is infamous for only being able to focus on one or maybe two problems at a time. So you ask anyone on the National Security Council about Turkey, for example, uh, a problem that may be in the middle tier, and you're lucky if you can get an answer. Um, but one of those problems which we also do, aside from not having the cross-issue capability to coordinate policy and to notice what Iran is doing in Senegal as part of a, a larger challenge from the Islamic Republic, is that we also too often sequence our policies. It's all well and good to say that we should have diplomacy first. First of all, let me just dismiss one thing out of hand. I don't know any serious policymaker who calls on, who wants military action against Iran. More often than not, I see it in terms of the straw man argument put there in order to ignore the Islamic Republic from, from other strategies and other criticisms, people saying there are people here that support that. I've yet to see them. I don't know. I don't believe in the whole Big Cheney conspiracy and everything like that from everything I've seen and from also trying to figure out how one operation, operationalizes decision making when one only has five people in his national security staff and so forth. At any rate, sequencing. It's all well and good to have diplomacy first, and yet at the same time, people like former CENTCOM commander John Abizade are saying, even if Iran develops a, um, a nuclear weapon, that it's possible to maintain. And yet people in Washington are talking about, and people in Washington are also talking about how we can contain. But what few people talk about is containment, in actuality, is a military strategy. It's a military strategy that requires repositioning of forces. It's a military strategy that um, includes, for example, reconfigurating the qualitative military edge formula used by Israel and the US Congress to determine what weapon systems and other systems and aid and support can be sent to the moderate Persian Gulf states in the Arab world, and so forth. We're not there yet. And if one needs to understand that there's, if anything, when it comes to the coercion which supports diplomacy, whether that coercion is economic or other, that such coercion enhances diplomacy rather than detracts from it. Um, one of the other very specific issues, not to get too much into the weeds, with regard to um, Iran's nuclear program and diplomacy and inspections and so forth, is the understanding that, um, as Reagan said, trust but verify, but it, it makes a big difference how you verify. The IAEA is only qualified by law, by, by its regulations, to look for declared weapons programs and to inspect declared weapons programs. So if there's a covert program, that's something beyond the IAE's immediate purview. But also, when one has inspections, oftentimes one imagines them as instantaneous inspections, for example, when it comes to video cameras and reviewing the footage and so forth. In reality, you can have as much as a month go by within inspections of Iran's declared enrichment facilities. And in that month, what can happen? Um, I'm drafting a report for the, the, um, the coates Rock Commission, which will come out later this fall, on addressing Iran's nuclear threat, and we commissioned some work from RAND people and others looking at some of the technical aspects. If there was a covert um, enrichment facility, built as a shadow, for example, of the cons, but without the inspections, it would take 6,000 P1 centrifuges or 3,000 P2 centrifuges approximately 16 days to produce 20 kilograms of 93.1% enriched uranium from 4.8% feed with a tail enrichment of 2.26%. 
Likewise, if one wanted to use a different calculation in the tons, 20,000 centrifuges, if there are 20,000 centrifuges there, Ahmadinejad has now talked about 6,000, but upping the amount to 50,000, it would take 24 days by batch recycling to achieve the, 20, the same 20 kilograms of highly enriched uranium. That doesn't mean that everything with Iran's program has to be taken off the table, but if you have inspections which in practice only look at the facility once every month, and one can divert enough material to produce <coughs> enough 93.1% enriched uranium to build a, um, a nuclear bomb in 16 days, one has a problem in how much trust we can put in the inspections. Um, in conclusion, those are, those are two different issues. There's also the issue of informal influence. Um, the Iranian electrical system being hooked into Western Afghanistan, being hooked into Nejef and Karbala, that's great soft power. I wish with all the billions of dollars the Americans have spent, we could put um, a functioning electrical grid there. But we also have to recognize that while local governors in Nimruz province, for example, might be grateful, it also creates a situation where Iran can shut off the lights if they don't act the way we want them to act, um, and so forth. Um, I don't believe that military force would work with Iran, as Patrick has enunciated, and I think as many other people here agree with, Iranians are tremendously nationalistic, rightfully or wrongfully, they will try to use that nationalism to wrap Iranians around the flag. Um, and, I mean, listening to President Bush's speeches and hearing them as they're replayed in the Farce News Agency or so forth, it's almost as if one is listening to two very different speeches. We have to be cognizant of that. Um, leaving enough for Q&A, just one observation which I find most intriguing with regard to where Iran is going right now and what possibilities exist for less kinetic action. Um, societally, looking at the labor movement in Iran is especially fascinating. Patrick and I did an article about three years ago comparing the labor movement in the years before the Islamic Revolution, 1977, 78, 79, to the growth of the labor movement now. Um, and how, and I'd argue that both the Islamic Republic and its supporters and its detractors within the Islamic Republic are very cognizant of that pattern and have been working very strongly in order to promote it or to quash out that independent civil society. One has the outward hired union workers who are on strike now, the sugarcane workers down in Khuzestan. Um, as Andrew Apostolou mentioned, the Vahid bus drivers, Mansour Osamu is still in prison, and the most interesting thing about the Vahid bus drivers union is it's the first truly independent trade union. If ever there was a good dance moment, that is it. And arguably we've blown it. Now there could be a huge debate which is ongoing within the human rights community about whether U.S. support helps or hurts, and if so, what kind of support formal, informal, and so forth. I don't buy the logic that it's all negative. After all, oppression of human rights occurred well before um, the $6 million um, in direct democracy aid of what's often called the $75 million, um, and so forth. But let me leave it there, because I want to leave enough time for the other panelists, and we'll have time for Q&A and at lunch and so forth to continue the discussion. Thank you. So I'm in a rush, and I cut a lot of it. Uh, Holocaust denial appeared in the West at the end of the, after, immediately after the end of the Second World War, both in the West and the Middle East, independently of each other. Yet in recent years, it is, it is more prevalent in the Muslim Middle East than in any other area in the, in the world. Uh, moreover, Iran is the only state whose leadership professes denial as a state policy. Uh, Iran's President Ali Mahmoud Ahmadinejad has rightly earned the notoriety in the past two years for his repeated denial of the Holocaust, but it would be a mistake to think that uh, he is an exception in Iran in this regard because of his radical uh, views. Rather, the entire Iranian leadership, starting from Supreme Leader uh, Ayatollah Ali, Ali Khamenei, has been engaged in Holocaust denial for years. The difference between Ahmadinejad and others is more important than in substance, and he's, uh, also in his appeal uh, to Western audiences, whereas other Iranian uh, leaders 
address their own constituencies in denying the Holocaust, so the world did not listen to them. Uh, now, the Arab and Iranian Holocaust discourse is part of a broader anti Zionist and anti Semitic discourse which developed as part and parcel of the Arab Israeli conflict. The most blatant manifestations of this discourse are the prevalent use of the anti Semitic discourse, I mean, as the prevalent use of the notorious protocols of Letters of Zion, uh, and also charges of Jewish use of uh, uh, children's blood for ritual purposes. Uh, the Middle Eastern Holocaust discourse has dealt very little, if at all, with the events of the Holocaust itself, with the process that led to it, or with the experience of the victims. Rather, this, uh, this uh, discourse focuses on the political implications of the Holocaust and the Arab Israeli conflict, on what was perceived as Israeli instrumentalization of the Holocaust, and on its manifestations, on the status of, uh, on, sorry, on its ramifications, on the status of Israel and Zionism. Uh, uh, consequently, we can trace uh, the following uh, attitudes toward the Holocaust in the Iranian and uh, Muslim communities, <coughs> uh, which range on the spectrum from justification to the false allegation of cooperation between Zionism and Nazism in extermination of the Jews, uh, to equation between Z Nazism and Zionism, and finally the most prevalent uh, theme of denial of the Holocaust. Unlike the West, Preoccupation with the Holocaust or with Holocaust denial is not confined to marginal or extreme groups, but is shared by political establishments and mainstream uh, political and ideological movements. Uh, denial of the Holocaust in the Middle East political and intellectual debate aimed primarily at demolishing the moral historical basis of Zionism. Again, the most blatant manifestation of this instrumentalization of, the, of denial is its occasional uh, appearance with claims with explanations why Hitler was right in exterminating the Jews. For instance, Rav Sanjani, a few months ago, explained that Hitler killed the Jews because Zionist control of, of Europe uh, a few decades uh, earlier. Or, uh, of course, another, uh, the prevalent view, again, in this regard, uh, has been that Zionism, which lacks any moral or historical justification, is based on a series of unfounded historical myths in outright distortions, the Holocaust is seen as one of the major myths that Zionism invented in order to gain Western political and financial support. Hence, the premise behind Holocaust denial is, there, is that the refutation of this lie will totally undermine Israel's international status and legitimacy. In addition, uh, denial sought to present Israel as an unscrupulous state that resorted to any means in order to uh, extort Western financial and political support. The most prominent example, perhaps, of this uh, um, understanding is a statement by Supreme Leader uh, Ali Khamenei in April 2001 that, and I quote, the Zionists exa had exaggerated Nazi crimes against European Jewry in order to solicit international support for the establishment of the Zionist entity in 1948. There is evidence he added that a large number of non-Jewish hooligans and thugs of, uh, Eastern of, uh, from Eastern Europe were forced to migrate to Palestine as Jews, as part of this conspiracy. Uh, presumably influenced by Arab Holocaust discourse, Iranians often employed contradictory arguments relating to the Holocaust, uh, particularly denial and the accusation of the Zionism uh, collaborating with the Nazis and killing the Jews. Again, as an example, a uh, former Majlis uh, speaker, uh, Mehdi Kerubi, who is considered to be a reformist and other in domestic politics, uh, explained in an anti-Zionist rally in October 2000 that Hitler's massacre of innocent Jews in Germany, only Jews in Germany, not in other places, was a conspiracy of the Zionists and that uh, David Ben-Gurion, the founder of the Zionist entity, had personally sent 40,000 Jews from Palestine to Germany to be exterminated by the Nazis. And then he added that only poor uh, and non-Zionist Jews were killed, whereas the wealthy and the Zionists were spared. By the way, the Iranian press claimed that uh, the, Zion the Holocaust was an American myth in order to divert attention from American crimes in the Second World War and, and blame Germany. Uh, <clears throat> again, the instrumentalization is also evident in, uh, in the frequent e equation between Zionism and Nazism, or between the so-called Gestapo-like policies of Israel and those of Hitler, 
But while verifying Israel, such comparisons often serve to belittle uh, the scope of, the Nazi, of Nazi crime atrocities. Again, in a sermon on uh, Jerusalem's day on uh, January 1988, Ali Akbar of Sanjani, the number two man in the Iranian hi hierarchy, who prides himself to be an expert on Judaism and Zionism, explained that Israel uh, was much worse than uh, Hitler because uh, Hitler killed at the most only 200,000 Jews. Whereas the Zionists supposedly killed more than one million Palestinians. Uh, in addition, he argued that the Nazism and Zionism are alive because uh, Hitler's claims on uh, Aryan supremacy are equal to uh, Jewish claims of the superiority of the Jewish race. And again, the purpose of this equation was evident in a statement by Mohsen Rezaei, uh, secretary of the powerful uh, Iranian Expediency Council, and former commander of the Revolutionary Guards, who counted Nazism, apartheid, and Zionism as the three sinister inhumane phenomena in the 20th century, and predicted that Zionism would finally meet a similar fate as Nazism, that is destruction. Now, Iran went further than any Arab country in hosting and officially endorsing and sponsoring uh, Western Holocaust deniers who faced persecution, uh, sorry, prosecution, uh, in, in the uh, countries, and I can give you a list of uh, names which I will skip for lack of time. Uh, uh, again, the most maybe prominent example was the French Holocaust denial, Gaudi, who was, after uh, being convicted in France, uh, came to uh, Iran, uh, was given audience with uh, Supreme Leader Khamenei, with the reformist President Khatami, uh, and many other state leaders, and Iran has also collected money to help him pay the fine. Uh, which he uh, uh, was supposed to pay. Now, to conclude, I want to make some general observations. Uh, Iran Holocaust denial, denial is not a consequence of ignorance of historical facts. The great effort to provide denial a pseudo-scientific basis reflects a certain awareness of the enormity of the valid uh, evidence of the Holocaust. In addition, the exclusive reliance on Western Holocaust denial is a product of selective and manipulative reading and borrowing of material published in the West and a conscious disregard for the vast scholarly, publicist, and literary output dealing with the Holocaust that does not suit uh, the Iranian ideological conviction. It is also reflective of the broader phenomenon of the narrow and superficial borrowing uh, from the West, which is typical of Islamist movements uh, as a whole. However, whereas in uh, in Europe, Holocaust deniers rep represent fringe elements that are still despised by mainstream intellectual and academic circles. In Iran, again, the most serious, uh, senior government officials and in media and academics uh, play a leading role in Holocaust denial while in endorsing the Western deniers. Uh, consequently, the Iranian public is not exposed to, other, uh, to the other more truthful aspects of, of history. Uh, now, while Iran professes to be anti-Nazi, such denials uh, minimize the extent and depth of Nazi evil and brutality. Again, the selective reading of Western denial literature and the contradictory arguments raised by some of the Iranian writers raise the question of their own genuine belief in their own arguments and uh, statements. It is very likely that ordinary Iranians, again, who are not exposed uh, to Western academic literature on the Holocaust, do believe in the propaganda that they, they are being served. But also we have to remember that uh, contradictions are not uncommon among anti-Semites throughout history. So it is perfectly possible that the Iranians set, genuinely believe in uh, what they say. Uh, now, uh, Iran Holocaust denial is a manifestation of anti-Semitism disguised as anti-Zionism. Using the pretext of Zionist fabrication of the Holocaust, Iran distorts and denies Jewish history and deprives the Jews of their human dignity by presenting their war strategy as a scam, even though this has got nothing to do with Zionism per se. The very claim of Zionist invention of the Holocaust appeals to tendency in both European and Middle Eastern anti-Semitism to charge Jews with unscrupulous machinations in order to achieve illegitimate and immoral uh, goals mainly financial extortion, uh, mainly financial extortion. It aims at demolishing the legit legitimacy of the Jewish state, which they claim is based on the Holocaust myth. As such, 
is in tune with uh, anti-Jewish and anti-Zionist sentiments in Europe, which argue that the Jews forfeited the status as victims by victimizing the Palestinians, and that Israel does not have the right to exist because uh, the human price it requires is too high. Uh, finally, uh, while Iran professes to be anti-Nazi, again, Holocaust denial and the equation of Zionism with Nazism minimizes the extent and depth of, of Nazi uh, evil, thereby serving the cause of Western neo-Nazis and others and other Semites. And again, the qualification of Zionists as Nazis is intended to offend the most painful feelings of the Jews by equating them with their worst uh, tormentors. Not only that this accusation deprives the Jews of the dignity and of the dignity and transforms the victims into perpetrators, but the more important point is that it threatens them, or at least many of them, with the ultimate fate of the Nazis. Thank you. Thank you and now, uh, Yor Hanneman Bavar will speak about the Iranian use of the internet for propaganda and Holocaust denial. There are currently two leading trends in approaching the relations between new media and states. One, identified as the determinist approach, assumes that news and propaganda can no longer be totally controlled by particular governments or commercial media. There is a vast quantity of internet and satellite channels of alternative news that can be easily accessed by ever-growing audiences. The internet has the potential to politically empower populations and expose them to diverse contents. The flow of information uh, is also challenging regimes of all sorts. A second trend, identified as the instrumentalist approach, assumes that states hold a wide variety of strategies to secure and retain their power in the age of information technology. Even if the state does not try to maximize its control over the internet, single ownership of the media and narrow interests, whether political, economical, or others, limit the diversity of voices, free integration of public opinion and national debates. No less important, internet technology offers new challenge for new channels for states to implement and advance their policies and reach much wider audiences than the old media. My presentation is based on an ongoing research of monitoring the different usages of modern information technology in Iran during the course of the past three years. While the two mentioned approaches can be applied to the Iranian case, as I've shown uh, on other occasions, I would like to focus today on several cultural aspects of the Iranian propaganda net online specifically in light of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's inflammatory rhetoric which combines denial of the Holocaust with the delegitimation of Israel's right to exist. For the sake of the argument, I will use propaganda in its widest sense, meaning the management of collective attitudes by the manipulation of significant symbols and ways in which they are manif manifest manif manifest manifested um, culturally through media propaganda and news spectacles online. In this respect, the Iranian propaganda net online includes an official and unofficial or semi-official dimensions. The official propaganda is transferred through several channels and directed to different target audiences. First, there is the Iranian local audience. Second, Iranian expatriates and exiles. Third, the Persian-speaking communities, especially Afghanis and Tajikis. There are also uh, propaganda which is directed to foreign audiences, uh, like non-Iranian Shiite population, Arab-speaking populations, non-Arab Muslims, and non-Muslims. In recent years, the Iranian regime has invested tremendous resources in the Internet. Among other things, the Islamic Republic has used the Internet to export the Islamic ideology of Ayatollah Khomeini to advance Iran's aspirations for regional hegemony in information and communication technology development as well, 
and support its political ideology against the U.S. and Israel. For these ends, the Islamic Republic have established a very impressive multilingual and multi-channel internet presence that includes news outlets, news agencies, government websites, Iranian leadership websites, and satellite and internet, internet TV stations. In addition to these channels, the Iranian uh, government is engaged in launching cultural events and spectacles supported and document, documented by online activities such as the International Exhibition and Conference, well-documented uh, events online uh, include uh, the exhibition in, uh, of October 2005 uh, and the conference World Without Zionism held in Tehran where Ahmadinejad quoted Ayatollah Khomeini by saying the Imam said the regime occupied, occupying Jerusalem must vanish from the pages of time. A second event was the Holocaust International Cartoon Contest of 2006. The contest was launched as a counterattack against the Muhammad cartoons published by the Danish newspaper Jolen Posten on September 2005. Via website of irancartoon.ir Artists from all over the world were invited to send satirical cartoons about the Holocaust. Most of the cartoons were posted regularly on the website. From the official Iranian standpoint, this event was intended to show that when it comes to freedom of expression, the West places its own limits. During the contest and the exhibition that followed, Iranian media outlets repeated the theory about the Holocaust being a myth. The director of Iran's Center for Cartoons and curator of the contest, Mas'ud Sujai Tabatabai, said on Iranian national TV that the exhibition website was attacked twice by Zionist circles, <coughs> that the exhibition's management received thousands of threatening emails and uh, offers of money to prevent from the opening of the exhibition. It was also reported that the site was obviously be put down by the Americans but it was not. Uh, now let's watch just a very short report about this exhibition. Holocaust is in the Suzy Jami and Salma that Tarif, the government's action. Yet for that was the Lazar and Yebegan Abu Bate has met the Nazi, Vabe, Satira, Sula, and some Salamu to the Halak, that Yaman is a form of third Zamani Kibra Sura for the Shahaba. انبوهی از مسیحیان به علت اینکه آزه نشدند از مسیحیت اعلام به انزدار کنند و به دیر یهود در آید در آتش سودانده شدند اما بای دیگر پس از جنگ دوم جهانی ادعای هولوکاست یک بار دیگر در تاریخ محضر شد که افثانه بیش نبود افثانه که باید از کشتار شش میلیون یهودی دارد این همه بوران شود که ای خبر Contrary to his determination about the mythical numbers, Sujai Tabatabai was quite lost for words when he was asked by the Danish reporter why, for example, the cartoon of the Portuguese Augusto Cid, if you can see it, this is not a conspiracy, I assure you. Um, uh, the cartoon by uh, the Portuguese uh, cartoonist, we will have to see it like this, um, Augusto C. was not part of this exhibition, perhaps because uh, it depicts Ahmadinejad standing uh, or visiting the Auschwitz Museum and saying that his explanations for all these deaths is a bird flu. Currently, the Iranian House of Cartoon, with collaboration of SyriaCartoon.com, uh, hosts the international contest Death in Gaza with a very similar theme to the Holocaust exhibition. The deadline is actually today. 
Another feature of the Iranian propaganda net involves documentaries of either short cartoon segments or complete series accompanied by an introduction of like-minded scholars and narrators. One example is The Merchants of the Myth, featuring some of the most notorious Holocaust deniers in Europe. The following animated examples were broadcasted recently on Iranian satellite channels. The first cartoon segment, which you will uh, see in a few seconds, uh, is from the Islamic Republic of Iran news network. It depicts uh, a very swastika that grows a giant and threatening star of David. Uh, generally, there are several repeated motives in these productions, which are very similar to current online anti-Semitic and anti-Israeli propaganda in the Arab media. Uh, Joel Kutek, a political scientist at the Free University of Brussels, indicates that anti-Zionism anti has become a civil religion in Belgium. Its credo is that Palestinians are always right and the Israelis are always wrong. In his vast research about Arab media uh, and anti-Semitic cartoons, uh, Kotek identifies ten major repeated themes in, uh, again, Arab media. Uh, the first motive is presenting Jews, uh, Zionists, or Israelis as inhuman. Second motive, presenting Israel as a Nazi state. A third motive involves the appropriation of the classic motive of Deicide, the murder of God, following the betrayal of Judas. Uh, fourth motive, zoomorphism, presenting Jews as animals. A fifth motive is connected with conspiracy themes regarding the Jewish designs for global domination. A sixth motive relates to the corrupting force of the Jews. A seventh motive, blood liability. Eighth motive, infant side. Ninth, Muslim want peace, Israel do not. And tenth motive, apologies for suicide bombers, terrorism, and violence. The justification for Islamic violence is apparent in the second segment that you can see right now, which is part of an ongoing series titled The Child and the Invader. The, th the series is being shown on Iranian multilingual Sahar TV online, which uh, operating uh, since 2003 and currently available through satellite TV on internet. The Child of the Invader series depicts several episodes of an Israeli soldier who is viciously molesting innocent Palestinian kids. Throughout this series, he runs them over with his jeep while they are, ride their bicycles, uh, he destroys their fields, steals their sheep, guns down their kites, etc. <coughs> Confronted with the unjust harassment, uh, the kid retreats to violence and overcomes his soldier's aggression. A third feature of the Iranian propaganda net involves multicast, extravagant productions of TV miniseries and broadcasts of foreign productions to English-speaking viewers such as the Syrian series El Shatat, the Diaspora, based on the manufacturer's protocols of the Elders of Zion. One of the most expensive miniseries ever financed by the Islamic Republic so far is Zero Degree Terminal, Zero Degree Orbit, made through the cooperation of Iran, Hungary, France, and Lebanon. Zero Degree Term narrates the love story of the Iranian Palestinian student Khalid Pasa and the Jewish French student struck on the background of the Jewish persecution during the Second World War. This soap opera, which attracted a large audience in Iran and encompassed sympathy for the Jews of this period, was widely cited as an effort by the Islamic Republic to demonstrate its position in regards to the differences between Jews and Zionists. Yet, this attempt for differentiation grows pale by recurrent use of classic anti-Semitic motives and Jewish symbols presented in other productions by Iranian state-ran television. Forty Soldiers, a miniseries of 28 episodes, was aired last year every Thursday night on Channel 2. Written and directed by Mohammad Noizad, the production included 300 actors filled in 100 locations, took four years to produce and cost more than two billion toman which is a little over $2 million. The series explores Iranian history during four periods. The pre-Islamic period, the life of Imam Ali, 
the 10th century and the life of Fedosi and the modern era. One of the episodes of 40 soldiers depicts the conquest of the Jewish fortress of Chaiba during the 7th century by a Muslim army led by Imam Ali. The wooden gate of the Jewish fortress is carved with the huge Star of David, and the Jews of Chaiba are presented as aggressors seeking to harass peace-loving Muslims. The final episode of 40 soldiers depicts a future U.S. invasion to Iran and the elimination of the U.S. army by mythological Iranian heroes. Another interesting broadcast features a lecture by Professor Hassan Bukhari, a, a philosophy professor with uh, a very impressive credentials, um, and he also serves as an advisor to the Iranian <coughs> Ministry of Education uh, and Director General of the Research Department of the Academy of Arts. One of Bukhari's topics, uh, favorite topics, uh, is Hollywood and conspiracy theories. We'll see just 10 seconds of something that he had to say. <laughs> Uh, during this seminar that broadcasted uh, on uh, Iranian national TV in February 2006 uh, on channels 4, uh, Bukhari explained how the classic cartoon Tom and Jerry created by a Jewish company, Walt Disney, is a production meant to improve the image of the cunning mouse because Jews were called dirty mice by Europeans during World War II. As a reference to, the, to this claim, he offers viewers who watch the movie Schindler's List. However, there was no one in the audience that could have questioned some of Bukhari's basic inaccuracies. Tom and Jerry were not created uh, by Walt Disney, but by William Hanna and Joseph Barbera, who were American uh, animators of Lebanese origins. The series was produced for MGM and not Walt Disney, who was not uh, Jewish. Um, and of course, uh, he was responsible, responsible for another uh, mouse, but uh, that one was called uh, Mickey. Uh, so far, uh, I've discussed the official side of the propaganda net online. The unofficial propaganda, or semi official one, is conducted by either groups or individuals. In most cases, these individuals form part of a group, belong to an organization, or an online forum or community. Similar to the official propaganda online, it operates on several channels. Setting up websites, online forums, news portals, and web blogs, such as Ahmadinejad's blog, Sahat TV, for example, initiated an unofficial internet branch called Sahat TV Europe. Its objective is, and I quote, Our purpose is distributing the works which you are carefully kept away from by Zionists and international jury. Our greatest concern is offering opposition to the criminal set of religion Zionism and international jury. So please give us a chance. Like our president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, we are really peace-loving people." End quote. A second feature of the unofficial propaganda involves responses and correspondence in weblogs, websites, news outlets, etc. In many cases, responses online contain extreme violent language that is better be left unquoted, especially here. A third motive of the semi-official propaganda is manifested in post-recorded videos of TV series, religious sermons, conferences, etc. Most of the segments I showed here are documented by the Middle Eastern Media Research Institute and other research centers. However, they are also discussed at length and available in short and full version through passworded forums ran by Iranians or like-minded racist neo-Nazi groups and white supremacy advocates. I had no trouble, for example, finding the movie Zara's Blue Eyes, 
dubbed in Arabic with English, Turkish, and Dutch subtitles. The TV fictional drama, directed by Ali Darshi, was aired by Iranian Sahar One TV station in 2004, focusing on the capture of seven-year-old Zahra by the fictional Israeli high-ranked military officer with political ambitions. The plot depicts how Israeli doctors are harvesting organs from Palestinian children. Following the broadcast of this TV drama, France has banned Sahar One from its airwaves in February 2005. The Netherlands have responded the same in 2006. The Iranian authorities blame the Zionists for that act. In one of the forums online where a link to download Zahra's Blue Eyes is posted, one of the forum members wrote the following response. In the past, I used to hand out flyers. Nowadays, I burn CDs. And I ask people, do you have a computer? And if they say yes, I give them a CD with several interesting internet movies on them. A third feature of the Iranian propaganda net online is connected with personal and amateur productions of short video clips available for direct viewing online. Ever since the establishment of YouTube in 2005, self-made video clips have become a vibrant feature online. YouTube's popularity has inspired similar initiatives in the form of Google Video, Dailymotion, Mega Video, uh, AOL Video, Foreshare, etc. Alongside these English hosts, we are witnessing the rise of particular providers directed to the Persian-speaking world and Muslim populations, such as the Gimbia 2, Iran 2, Farsi 2, and Iran Clip. For the religious-oriented net users, Shia TV was established. Shia TV hosts right now about 10,000 short video clips and over 5,000 registered members. One of the members, uh, on one of the most popular members of Shia TV, nicknamed Ali Ali, presents himself as a married 27 senior software engineer. His favorite book is the Quran, and his uh, interests and hobbies are include uh, recite poetry praising Allah and Muhammad and his other bait, spreading the message of Islam amongst non-Muslims, spreading awareness about truth amongst people, help the helpers of the mission of Imam Mahdi and be an obstacle in the path of the enemies of Imam Mahdi and his mission." End of quote. For summation, I would like to stress that more than a student of Iranian history and culture for the past 15 years, I stand here today as a daughter and granddaughter of Holocaust survivors whose biggest legacy was never forget. This is my motive. As of this month, there are 1. billion people around the world who are using the internet in one way or another. This rate is expected, is expected to grow with the proliferation of telecommunication infrastructure and connection of new regions to the World Wide Web. From the following slide covering net use in the Middle East and North Africa, we can see that Iran is leading with an estimated rate of 18 million net users. Turkey, second, with 16 million, followed by Morocco, Egypt, um, and Saudi Arabia, and Israel, in this case, is sixth. Although the Middle East uh, net users comprise merely 4% of world surfers, uh, from 2000 to 2007, the net use in the Middle East witnessed an amazing growth of over 900%, one of the highest growth uh, rates uh, in the world. In recent years, the Islamic Republic of Iran has put itself at the forefront of the anti-Semitic campaigns on the internet. Through the use of classic anti-Semitic symbols that developed in other places in different times, the lines between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism blur and dissolve into thin air online. Beyond the publication of new editions of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion by Islamic Republic, these texts are being referred to and quoted on Persian web blogs as if they were containing well-grounded historical facts. Yet besides these trends, voices, sides, and images, 
Diverse countries, organizations, groups, and individuals are active online. Cultural propaganda is by no means one country's trait. To support this last point, I shall allow the final video clips, and I will end my presentation with it, and it will speak um, itself. might be different. I think it was if they were sure that this that the Iran had this thing I guess the question is is it is it not clear to the idea strategist that that this is a, a, a real case and that the concern of just long range missiles coming uh, into Gaza is a more a reality than a concern of the future? Um, I would just suggest, trying to suggest that in the event that Iran had uh, nuclear capabilities, that uh, the IDF would worry it might actually translate it to having nuclear weapons, that the IDF would take that into consideration in thinking about military operations, be it in Gaza, be it against Syria, be it against Lebanon, in the event of provocations in any other places. I was just trying to give a, a, an example, perhaps a chosen one, of how the, even ambiguous nuclear capability by the part of Iran uh, would make a difference in um, the, the politics of uh, the Middle East. And sometimes the suggestion is made, such as by foreign president uh, Chirac from France, that uh, what would Iran do with the nuclear because if Iran ever used it against the, the Tel Aviv, then Iran would be uh, destroyed in retaliation. I uh, was trying to illustrate how even an ambiguous nuclear uh, capability can in fact help influence, help advance the interests of the country and influence the politics of the region. Uh, that was, that was my sole point. The, the point that you just made right now, do you think uh, about like, the advantages in foreign policy? Do you think that there was any advantage in foreign policy of Israel with respect to atomic bomb? Sure. That, uh, I mean, for example, like being like, so emboldened in the past 10, 15 years in the Middle East, do you think has anything to do with having the bomb? And was it okay for Israel to, to use that? I don't know, other countries. 
Well, I think that uh, Israel's possession of nuclear weapons, certainly emboldened Israel, uh, to feel that its security could be more safe in spite of the risk of, uh, that it faced of uh, attack by a number of Arab countries at the same time. And that's one of the important reasons why I think Israel was prepared to make peace with, with Egypt and return the territories to, the, to Egypt, the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt, was that Israel felt more secure about its uh, uh, security. Uh, and, and in general, I would argue that the uh, that uh, countries which face overwhelming opponents that want to wipe them off the, uh, off the face of the earth are, are likely to want to have a doomsday weapon. And that's the reason why it's going to be very hard to persuade a country like Pakistan, faced with the India threat, North Korea, faced with the South Korean American threat, or Israel, faced with what it saw as a, a, an Arab threat, to give up nuclear weapons. After all, the reason the United States had nuclear weapons was a similar reason. Uh, and um, these are the really difficult cases when countries want to doomsday weapon. Uh, Iran is not in that situation. It's not. Secretary General Bond of the United Nations likes to say that North Korea acquires nuclear weapons out of desperation, Iran pursues them out of aspiration. Uh, and, and I think that captures the difference. Iran is out to have greater influence in the region. It does not face an enemy who threatens to overrun. Just one answer. There's a complete asymmetry in the Middle East conflict. Uh, uh, let's say there used to be 20 Arab states versus one Israel, or the, let's say Iran versus Israel. Israel has never been able, will never be able to defeat or conquer the entire Middle East. The Arabs can lose 50 wars, but if they win one war, that's the, that's the, that's the end of the conflict. Israel can win 50 wars, but if it loses one war, that's the end of Israel. There's a basic asymmetry. Iran is eight times bigger than Israel. Israel will never be able to conquer Iran or destroy Iran and so on. But it is much easier, here I can quote uh, Rav Sanjani who said, is sufficient for one nuclear bomb or several nuclear bombs to destroy Israel, the Muslim world can take many nuclear bombs. Therefore, there's a complete asymmetry in this regard. Israel never claimed, as far as I know, and I lived there for the past 50 years, that it would destroy or wish to destroy any Arab state or wish to destroy Iran. Whereas Iranians, Iranian leaders have repeatedly stated their desire, aim, aspiration to destroy Israel. In that sense, there's complete asymmetry in the Atlantic way between the two. Um, I've heard so much from this panel, so much uh, about things that everybody knows, the old story. Very little about, from each one of you, about how we deal with Iran. My question to Patrick, for instance, we know that Iran relies heavily on China and Russia. We know that we have asked Chinese to help us with the Korean uh, nuclear why is it, or is there any possibility to go into that direction and try to deal with China and Russia? One thing our dealing with Europe, this way in Europe involved, is not going to help. But China and Russia have enormous influence. In fact, uh, Iran cannot survive without their support. support. So why is it that we're not going that direction? Some ideas. First, let me just suggest that I think you're quite right that the uh, approaching the great powers and having unity of the great powers in responding to the Iranian threat uh, offers some decent prospects of influencing the Iranian decisions. It's not uh, one that's guaranteed that it will work, but that it offers some decent prospects. Uh, and that's why this approach of working with the great powers has been a part of uh, both U.S. diplomacy and European diplomacy of the last several years. And that's why so much effort has gone into trying to achieve unanimity at the United Nations Security Council is to show the unity of the international community. Uh, uh, um, that has been the heart and core of the effort I'm very against Iran. I know that we are I'm, right, but I'm, I'm talking about how we approach Russia and China so that they, they can persuade them. This is my question. Uh, I would say that the essential way to persuade the Russians and Chinese is by emphasizing that a nuclear world world with many, many countries that are nuclear is not in their interest. I do not think that Russia or China care very much about threats against Israel. I don't think they care very much about the revolutionary character of the Iranian regime. But I would say, tell you that the Chinese do care a very great deal about the phenomena that was mentioned by Michael, that mainly that Japan 
could readily become a nuclear power. And that, at, uh, that is a nightmare for the Chinese leaders. <coughs> it suggests to the Chinese leaders that if Iran goes nuclear, so will other countries, such as Japan and Taiwan, is a good way to grab their attention as to why the Iran nuclear issue is a matter of Chinese national security concern. And I think that, in fact, the successes that we've had with China and Russia have been precisely because of the extent to which they worry about this. They worry, that is, about uh, greater proliferation throughout the world. On the whole, the Chinese leadership's attitude is that what one does with difficult enough, uh, regimes is one induces them and one uses strategic patience. That's the approach they've taken in the North Korea talks, which they care about a very great deal. Uh, and so it's not surprising to me if that's their approach towards Iran. I happen to think that that's uh, a naive and generally effective approach. But I, I do think that that is the Chinese approach to this matter. Anybody else want to talk about it? Yeah, it was uh, a lot of them. Yeah, I want to uh, refer to another uh, nuclear activity. Uh, you guys all mentioned the uh, uh, Falcon uh, nuclear weapon, but there is uh, two men uh, nuclear weapon, which is also referred to be uh, the Delphi bomb. And uh, a few days ago, we actually officially were uh, told that uh, the site in Syria uh, was placed uh, with the uh, potential to generate a dirty bomb. Uh, I really wonder, uh, in the case of Iran, how close are they, or you know, maybe they already had the potential to generate a dirty bomb, and with their ties to Hezbollah uh, and other international organizations, how uh, of a real danger is it? Technically, it would be quite possible for Iran to produce already uh, a a radioactive dispersal device, dirty bomb. There are not any technical barriers I'm aware of to extend their way of doing that. If I could just add to what Patrick said for a second, forensically, the Patrick's absolutely right. Forensically, um, whether Iran acted directly or by proxy, it would be a lot more difficult to um, claim it for there to be plausible deniability in case of an Iranian use of. Um, I've already bombed either directly or by proxy. Yeah, actually, there's an interesting phenomenon that when a bomb explodes, it, of course, destroys most of the radioactive material. So, in fact, forensically, it's quite difficult to determine the source of the bomb. But with a uh, dirty bomb, because the material still continues to exist, it's actually forensically easier to determine the source of the bomb. Mr. Bilbrey. Uh, this question is, <coughs> is for the representative of of the Beach University. <clears throat> if, when Nasser made provocative remarks over and over again against the survival of Israel, Israel took quick react preemptive steps to we know the results of the Six Day War. How long will Israel be patient in the view of these far more provocative remarks and propaganda from Iran. In other words, how long is Israel prepared to take these insults and abuse from Iran before they do so? Uh, Israel did not, Israel did not uh, act against Egypt because of the provocative remarks. Egypt did not Israel did not act against Egypt because of provocative remarks, otherwise it would have been at war for the entire existence. Egypt attacked in, Israel attacked in 1967 after the Egyptians violated the 1956 uh, agreements and they poured army into Sinai and they uh, it was, uh, and it formed an alliance, military alliance saw the Middle East, which was forced to attack Israel. Only then did we attack Egypt. So uh, I don't think that Israel would ever attack Iran because of provocative remarks. Uh, I think it would be a totally unwise policy. I hope it would never be done. Uh, <coughs> frankly, I'm uh, far from being enthusiastic of Israeli action, military action against Iran. It's far beyond Israeli capabilities. And uh, you certainly not, would not attack Iran simply because of provocative remarks. Otherwise, we should have been at war in, since 1978, and we must not do, do so. Uh, in the news, uh, I don't believe that there is even um, 
an agreement among uh, Israeli public opinion, at least the mainstream, that even supports, uh, I, I don't think there is a, a, a consensus about um, Israel attacking um, the Islamic Republic or Iran, um, and of course doing it quite well. One of the issues which is oftentimes left out of the discussions on um, whether a U.S. military strike, an Israeli military strike, or for that matter, an other military strike, sometimes people bring up in public debate the whole issue of the Osirak strike against Iraq in 1981. The biggest difference with Iran is that while well, Osirak was um, a, a concentrated location, if there were to be any military action against Iran, given the dispersal of its program and the nature of its program, it would take about 1,400 sorties. And what you're talking then about in any strike is a complete lack of tactical and operational surprise. And it's just one of those complicating factors that oftentimes we don't talk about when throwing around these popular um, these scenarios which are popular in public debate. Professor Gordon. Yeah, I, I think there, there was a comment about, at least I got from your comments, that if the Iranians were getting a nuclear weapon and the idea of they're simply using it against Israel, of course, that, that would be a suicide gesture on their part. But is it maybe a little simplistic to think of it in those terms if you consider that, first of all, of course, they could use maybe nuclear weapons by proxy through their uh, terrorist clients? Um, and I realize that you just sort of talk about some of the implications of that. But even on a more, I guess, complicated level, once they have the nuclear weapons, and if their foreign policy changes and their view toward how they interact with the rest of the world, that you could imagine situations where they could get into uh, conflicts where there could be an escalation and where, because their views have changed and because they're more likely to get into situations of escalation, they could use nuclear weapons. It's not just so simple that they would get it and then just use it. It would change the way they interact with the rest of the world and put themselves in more of a likely situation where they might use it. That exactly. Um, I, I agree with you. And what I'm saying is if Iran got a nuclear weapon, I'm not sure that the immediate situation of, oh, we've got a nuclear weapon today, tomorrow we're on Israel, I don't think that's going to happen. But I agree with what you're saying. What I should say is whether they act by um, two points, whether they act directly or by proxy. I mentioned in my presentation about laying the groundwork for containment and understanding that containment is a military strategy, even if it's not a kinetic military strategy. On the same way, deterrence indicates that if there is going to be successful deterrence, it mandates an understanding that if Iran directly or by proxy utilizes nuclear weapons, that there will be a similar response against Iran. If there's going to be um, transparency to enable deterrence to work, politicians and officials need to be able to say that. At this point, there doesn't. And this brings the second point, which to me, look, when I read the things on the internet or Washington papers, and living in Washington, Washington's famous for its naval gazing. Everyone assumes that things happen around us. Oftentimes, my frustration with US policy is that I don't see any strategies. They play chess, we play checkers. Um, and the issue then becomes um, our reaction, which leads to the greatest danger, which I think you're highlighting, and I just want to highlight what you're highlighting, which is the greatest danger, to, in my mind, is an overconfidence developing and misreading of what the US red lines are to the point where um, we could stumble into a conflict that neither side wants. Yeah, just a quick joke. Uh, many years ago, when uh, an eminent political scientist uh, wrote an article in a book on the theme that uh, if countries acquire nuclear weapons and they become much more serious and sober in their calculations because they realize the terrible destruction that could be visited upon them if they were to use these nuclear weapons. And this author was arguing that therefore the spread of nuclear weapons was good for global stability. And one of his eminent colleagues uh, said, what a wonderful proposition. Let's apply the same principle to automobiles. Let us tie sticks of dynamites onto the front and rear bumpers of every car in the world, and then we can rest confident there will never again be an accident. <laughs> <laughs> Through a 
Proxy, I guess, has fallen on Lebanon. Uh, seems quite close to, we could see the Lebanese government fall. And Iran certainly having much greater say or much greater control in Lebanon through Hezbollah. And now the border of Egypt and Gaza seems to be open. And who knows what kind of weapons are flowing into Gaza. And Iran is certainly aiding and embedding the Hamas regime. What do you know about Iran's gas and chemical weapon capabilities and the potential that Hezbollah or Hamas may use it? And to the Israelis on the panel, why is the Israeli government sitting almost paralyzed watching Hezbollah completely rearmed? And who knows what's going into Gaza and how long is this intolerable situation? If I could just make a small comment about the, the, the question. Um, the UN Security Council resolutions uh, about Iran's and also about Lebanon uh, have included uh, prohibitions on the import of weapons into Lebanon uh, and prohibitions on the export of weapons from Iran. Yet Iran, the leader of Hezbollah tells us that uh, Hezbollah now has 40,000 rockets that the IDS estimates higher. Uh, I think it's unfortunate if we adopt the Security Council or elsewhere these tough sounding resolutions and then do nothing to enforce them. I think we have to be very careful in thinking about what it is that we have as a declaratory policy to make sure it fits with what we would like to do. And therefore, I think it would be very inappropriate for the Israeli government to make tough sounding statements about what it will do against Hezbollah and Hamas unless it thinks through very carefully and clearly whether or not that is in fact in Israel's national interest. If they make those tough on signing statements, I certainly hope they both will. Let me just say two things. Uh, suppose we attack Lebanon tomorrow to disarm Hezbollah. What then? Are we going to stay in Lebanon for the rest of our uh, history? It's possible, impossible. We, we tried it once, it failed miserably. Uh, the moment we will drop from Lebanon after such a bloody war, Hezbollah will be armed again. It goes back to my other question. We can never totally defeat Arabs. Only thing we can do is win time until the next uh, eruption of violence. Therefore, it is not in our interest to start unnecessary wars unless there is absolutely no other alternative. The same thing goes with Gaza. Okay, we'll invade Gaza tomorrow. We'll Clean Gaza. How many casualties for us and for the Palestinians? What then? Are we going to stay in Gaza for the rest of our lives? Because once we withdraw from Gaza, there's all likelihood that Hamas or whoever is there will rearm. So, in a sense, uh, such wars should come only when there's absolutely no other alternative, when the situation becomes totally unbearable. Fortunately, so far, and again, if you look at Hezbollah, Nasrallah said during the war later that had he known the kind of Israel response, he would not have started what he had done in June 2006. This is the way to prevent future wars, not to start them whenever they return, because again, otherwise, we would always be engaged in constant wars, full scale wars, which we cannot do. So if I could just throw one point out of what Patrick and Maya said. Um, when, Bill, when Bill Clinton and, and this also plays into the whole issue of diplomacy and so forth and how to best do it. When Bill Clinton went to Camp David II, without putting blame on one side or the other for the failure of Camp David II, no president, whether Democrat or Republican, goes to something of that stature without expecting to have a signing ceremony. And he came out of that feeling burned. One of the lessons learned in that was applied to the Libyan negotiations. The British, when they were doing the preliminary Libyan negotiations, it took about three years for the British negotiators to determine with confidence that, the peak, that Muammar Gaddafi would listen to and abide by who they were negotiating with. Now, this also applies with regard to Iran. It's wrong to say that we don't talk to Iran. We seldom stopped talking to Iran, both officially and unofficially through proxies and so forth. One of the greatest issues now, and this goes back to the first panel, is with regard to who is in control. And I'm not just talking about the power centers. 
it's wrong, I'd say, to talk about Iran's nuclear program. Look, 90% of the Iranian people are absolutely wonderful, and anyone that's ever spent time there knows that. But it's the guys with the guns matter that matter, and it's the military chain of command over that nuclear weapons program which matters, which also then issue, um, brings into the issue what was alluded to towards the question and answer period of the first panel, which is the rise of the Revolutionary Guard. If you will, I may see it differently than some others. I see it as a slow, creeping military coup d'etat when one looks at the connections, official or unofficial, between the parliamentarians, the governors, the deputy governors, the heads of the bunyads, and so forth, based on their service in the Revolutionary Guard. And so, in dealing with diplomacy and dealing with these issues, determining the sincerity is a key factor, and that's one issue which we haven't really been able to nail down yet. Yeah, I have a question about the, uh, the uh, development of the Iranians. And by the way, I want to thank the panel for that conversation. Iran has been responsible for training terrorists, for supporting Hezbollah, and for doing a lot of mischief in the area of dealing with Syria and so forth. Um, how do you see this uh, resolving itself? Is this going to continue forever? Will they continue to be adversarial conditions with Iran, or will it in some way find a solution uh, short of war? Where, where do you see this resolving itself? If I may tackle this first, um, first of all, I look forward to your presentation on this because one of the, the greater issues which I think undercuts um, countering terrorism is the lack of official definition. Denying it isn't helpful. One of the panelists on the first panel had been quoted on March 16th in Diplomacy Iani as saying that terrorism is a myth and that neither Hamas nor Hezbollah are terrorist groups. I think that's wrong, and it's the wrong approach. Um, if I had to pick a, ter a definition of terrorism, uh, and one needs to pick a definition of terrorism first in order to develop strategies to counter it, I would argue for a very simple definition. Terrorism is the deliberate targeting of civilians for political gain. And unfortunately, we don't. It, there was an article written by an Australian counter-terror um, expert who wrote that um, there are in surveying policy practitioners across the globe, there's over a hundred different working definitions of what terrorism is. So, no, I don't think it's going to go away. It's a useful asymmetric strategy. The rise of the 24-hour news media amplifies um, the benefits of that, but ultimately it's not going to be defeated until the costs of conducting terrorist operations outweigh the benefits. And this goes back into also forensic um, Whenever one conducts a ter terrorist operation, they expose themselves forensically and one can wrap up cells and so forth. Um, if one conducts targeted assassinations, for example, of terrorist leaders, not only does it knock the head off the top, but the younger people, the up-and-comers, A, are both suspicious over who leaked or where that intelligence came from, and also haven't had the time to psychologically prepare, which is when, I mean, for example, when I was in Israel in the year 2001, 2002, um, at the height of the suicide bombing campaign, um, one had instances of where someone would get, I would always just sit in the bus behind the fattest person there. Unfortunately, people were trying to sit behind me. Um, but <laughs> you have a situation where people would come in sweating, fortunately not on my bus, but um, actually on my roommate's bus it happened. And um, my roommate's bus was up, but um, where someone would come in sweating and someone could identify them as a suicide bomber and kick them off the bus before they could do it because, I'd argue, of the benefit of going after the terrorist leaders connectly. But others may have. Uh, uh, first, I uh, know the good time. I, I didn't think it was a great time. Uh, the Iran, the last vis-a-vis -vis Israel, certainly has two sides. It is an empty, problematic side. And I believe there is also a, a positive full side. It's only unfortunate that the dialogue that's happening only looks at the problematic and the, and, the, and the negative sides. And this is problematic and dangerous because Iran and the US, whether you like it, uh, Iran and Israel, whether you like it or not, are engaged or intended, I say, in what I call a spiral conflict. 
conflict that is based not just on reality, but on perceptions. And it's extremely dangerous to just see that side. But at the end of the day, we don't know what we can do with it. Uh, one thing I want to remind everybody that officialism, and I say this because I study, officialism does not consider Iran, quote unquote, an enemy. And the Israeli legal system does not have Iran as an enemy defined. And that's a place to start with from a positive perspective. That number one. I mean, it's like on the history and so on. The second, <laughs> very quickly, okay? I think the second thing is that I, I, I think it is important that we, we bring being the positive sides of this relationship, both in the past, historically, and today. Again, as I said, it is important that we look at the negative aspects, the empty side of it. And you did a very well job, it's good. But I think there has to be people, there have to be people out there that really also look at the other side. Because at the end of the day, if you wanted to make an enemy of anybody, you can. If you wanted to make a friend of anybody, you can. Okay. We have been involved in making the two into enemies, but we really have to look in the other side and try to make them also friends. Thank you. I want to say that um, most of the questions here were addressed to uh, issues of um, the nuclear weapons and whether or when Iran will have it or whether or not it's going to use it and how, and whether it's going to be against or Israel or some other countries in the area is one thing. Um, it is important for me, and this is what I was trying to do here, that there is something long-lasting in symbols that are being transmitted in all forms of channels of Iranian media today. There are things that are being internalized by children in Iran that never saw in their lives an Israeli or, a, or, a, or even a Jew, although there is a Jewish community in Israel, and the only impression in Iran, in Israel, in Israel um, and the only impressions that they get is that Jews or Israelis or Zionists look like this, and there is no counter discourse in Iran itself to say otherwise. Of course, there are also uh, uh, Iranian officials uh, in one way or another giving interviews mostly to Western media and of course all of his declarations of Madinajad was interviewed in uh, many news outlets around uh, Europe and in the US as well uh, trying to explain what exactly he meant uh, and of course his uh, point of view but the thing is what is going to be left after that uh, in the Iranian perception, the Iranian people about Jews or Zionists. It's not like you're walking in the streets and you can pinpoint to someone whether he's a Zionist or not, or, or whether he's Jewish. Uh, and, and these are the things that, uh, when I look to the future, whatever policies change, and of course, I'm, I can't say that I'll, I'm not looking forward for the day when I will be able to walk through the streets of Tehran as, as, as a visitor and as a guest. Um, but uh, I am scared about the implications and the long-term ramifications of these symbols being transmitted the way that they are. And, that, and it is a tendency that started in recent years because uh, in many interviews uh, by the directors of these series, they said that they began working on these series uh, many years ago. It's nothing new. But the thing is that they didn't get the right funds or it wasn't the right moment to broadcast them. So they waited. But now the Holocaust and, and uh, the anti-Zionism movement or discourse is, is more uh, into the mainstream so they can show it. And of course give it a stage. And, uh, this what uh, troubles me. And, uh, I think Matt said one point. Last question, and then it is. Yeah, we have this one of the house has to go. Okay. Allow me for a second to be cynical, and I apologize for that. I would be very happy to know what are the positive aspects today. 
But the fact that there was Cyrus the Great 2,500 years ago is meaningless today in modern world politics. No, you don't, uh, when January comes, you don't say, well, six months ago it was summer and spring and everything was wonderful, therefore I won't take my coat outside because six months ago it was uh, spring, uh, summer. You have to prepare yourself for the present world. Unfortunately, uh, again, uh, what is going on, uh, the, the kind of dehumanization of, of Jews and Israelis in Iran is overwhelming. And looking at that, and, and the fact again that, uh, there was, that we love to eat Persian food or we, uh, Israelis love Persian music uh, or the Osiris the Great is totally meaningless compared to this kind of dehumanization and again, without going too, becoming too radical, the 20th century has known too many examples outside the middle, outside Europe when dehumanization led to very tragic results and therefore we cannot disregard this type of dehumanization looking back nostalgically at the past and saying no, okay one uh, uh, I did not say that the disregard that exactly the, the fact that okay, you make those points not today, not a, except that you have I'm to do that as the chair we're going to have to turn so I'm going to the okay. okay Professor Reynas and then a the second question and then we have to end it very quickly how do you back with Mr. Lipak's uh, assessment of the Israeli position? You can win the battle and you cannot win the war because it's surrounded by people who survive for a longer time. And more of them, and they can continue. Therefore, I ask, this is not about Iran, I said, what about Israel? That's the assessment for Israel shared with you. Why do they have a policy which seems to, in fact, be a very tough policy, continue to expand the, uh, the settlement? Uh, when, when Hamas was elected by democratic means, uh, and the day after they became terrorists and were kept out of these negotiations with the Palestinians, how does Israel expect to make peace with the Palestinians when half the Palestinians are not in the game? So this is one indication of a very tough Israeli policy. If they take your position, which is that they cannot win by continuing wars, why do they not try to be a little more flexible in their thought policy? First of all, I am very much against settlements. I'm not going to defend settlements. Okay? In my opinion, it's the greatest folly of Israeli policy in the past 40 years. It's the greatest danger. It's a major danger for the future existence of Israel, the state of the Jews. Okay? So I'm not going to defend settlements. Secondly, Hamas was a terrorist organization before the elections and after the elections. The fact that the movement wins the elections democratically does not, make, does not abolish or nullify the terrorist activities or terrorist nature. You can, you, can, you can be elected and remain a terrorist. Thirdly, what flexibility with Hamas was what? Hamas had uh, advocated for years the elimination of Israel. Should I negotiate which way should be eliminated? The length of the time of this elimination or, or what? Hamas refused in the past to accept our existence. Today, Hamas speaks of certain conditions for a truce, a temporary truce, which they say can be violated the moment the Palestinians feel strong enough to violate it. But the conditions for this truce actually mean the peaceful elimination of Israel. That would be very difficult for us to negotiate. We're not going to negotiate our existence. You can you negotiate, now if you're talking about a two-state solution, the current government of Israel, publicly at least, advocates a two-state solution. So that is the greatest flexibility we can go. If the greater flexibility of, greater flexibility of what? Again, one-state solution is not, a, is not a solution for us. Settlements, I fully agree, is a stupid policy. Okay, last question, and then we're going to break for lunch. Uh, getting back to Holocaust denial, uh, and in the past year, uh, Germany agreed to open up the uh, documentation of close to 17 million cases uh, from World War II. My question is, will the release of that information have any impact on the denial? No. <laughs> Simply no. All of us denied is not a question of, of ignorance. It's not that one document will convince all of us the knives that the whole of the here. There's so far been tremendous amount of evidence on the Holocaust, any kind of evidence, documents, uh, pictures, testimonies. If that has not been enough 
for deniers than additional documents that were convinced. Okay, so just before we break, uh, I'm sorry, we have no more time. Um, there's lunch outside in the back for everybody who's here. You're very welcome. For you. And uh, secondly, I'd like to say the, the conference is ending this evening at about 5 o'clock. And at about 7.45 this evening, not connected to this conference, a famous uh, Iranian-born politician who's now the Deputy Prime Minister of Israel will be speaking at room SSS, um, which is at One Prospect. So there will be pause. We'll be speaking this evening at 7.45. You're, you're all welcome. He's the Deputy Prime Minister of Israel, Shaul Mufaz. We'll be speaking at 7.45 p.m. this evening, and it's open to the public. It's at 1 Prospect Street. It's room SSS. Uh, it's a male college. So please join us for lunch, and we're going to resume in about 40 minutes.
Yeah. No, I, I agree with what you're saying. Sorry. I agree with what you're saying. 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 I agree with what you